Euromax highlights. Coming up in this edition... Highest Bidder, a German art expert at Sotheby's in London. Say Cheese, a Swiss village and its internationally famous dairy product. Books Galore, a small town in France is paradise for bookworms. Euromax highlights. And here's your host, Karen Helmstedt. Hello there and a warm welcome to our Highlights Edition. Well, what better way to advertise a product than to have a headquarters that reflects the product itself? Well, that's the idea behind the concept of corporate architecture and a stunning recent example can now be seen just outside of Munich. Even by Munich standards, it's a remarkable building. This is the new headquarters of Pro Aurum, a company that trades in gold and other precious metals. Architect Rainer Freitag decided at an early stage to design the building to resemble a gold ingot. Allerdings there was a problem with this gold bar, of course, the need for windows to let in light for people working inside. A gold bar with holes in it is no longer a gold bar, so we soon scrapped the idea. But the idea eventually prevailed and took a year to realize. The building's dimensions above ground translate into a volume of 7,500 cubic meters, roughly equivalent to the total amount of gold ever mined. Rainer Freitag managed to solve the problem of windows by incorporating folding gold-colored shutters. Most of the metal came from recycled old coins. When the paneling was finished, we had car drivers stopping here to take a look. And the drivers behind them didn't honk, because they were looking too. What always matters is a building's overall unity, not just from the inside or outside. Here we had an alternate situation. We had a bold, golden and shining exterior and a very serious and restrained interior. Corporate architecture dates back. In the 1940s, German chemical giant Höchst had a logo based on one of its buildings. And later, BMW's offices in Munich were designed to evoke a four-cylinder engine. While computer maker Olivetti drew inspiration from its own PC cases. And Cologne-based luggage maker Remova has a factory modeled after its products. Of course, there are ways of making corporate architecture less striking. But you have to be careful of making it so unobtrusive that nobody even notices it. Products and premises do not always boast the degree of unity as seen at Fiat, which has a racing track over its Turin headquarters. Corporate architecture often refers to a firm having uniform visual branding across the globe. The most obvious examples are car makers. Or indeed, Swiss-based bag producer Freitag. We live in an age of fast-moving changes, and where it's important to capture that momentary glance in order to convey a message through corporate architecture. Despite what its appearance might suggest, it was the function of Pro Aurum's headquarters and not its form that had priority from the outset. The building had to cover a number of requirements, having an open design for visiting customers while ensuring the security of the precious metals inside. This is a key section of any company that trades in gold, the underground vault. Managing director Mirko Schmidt was initially skeptical of the architectural plans, finding the gold house too striking. But architect Rainer Freitag ultimately managed to persuade him of the design's merits. We wanted to send a signal for the gold market and for the city of Munich. We wanted to express this in the architecture, instead of using billboards or a distinctive company plaque. Pro Aurum has now built an unmistakable three-dimensional business card in Munich. And what's more, with a touch of gold. 
Well, in the latter half of the past decade, there's been a boom in the international art market with works fetching record-breaking prices. It's taken a slight dip recently because of the financial crisis, but it is still very lucrative. Now, works of high quality that are new to the market can also sell well, especially if German art expert Cheyenne Westphal is involved. The year's first contemporary art auctions in London took place in February. Part of Cheyenne Westphal's job involves placing bids for her clients via telephone. Many high-profile buyers prefer not to attend the auctions in person. They turn to Westphal and count on her discretion and expertise. No, okay. It's yours at one million nine hundred thousand pounds. Thank you. Is it difficult to turn the light on The art expert is one of the most powerful women on the international art scene. A native of Germany, she started working for Sotheby's in 1990. Westphal appraises works of art before they're put on the auction block. We try to optimize the presentation of each work of art and, of course, to encourage competitive bidding. That means it's important to give good advice to potential buyers and tell them what the final price might be and assure them that the works are worth it. This painting by German artist Gerhard Richter was sold for about 3 million euros. A work by Andy Warhol went for about a million euros. The Lenz collection features lesser-known works, which went to auction for the first time in 50 years. One month before the auction, Westphal met art collector Gerhard Lenz in Berlin. He spent decades collecting avant-garde works by artists from the so-called Zero Art Movement. Now he's auctioning off part of his collection. It took Westphal two years to convince Lenz to sell. He had a hard time parting with his artwork. These are all pieces we don't want to part with. The zero art of the 50s and 60s is in demand again. Like this piece by German artist Heinz Mack. Or artwork by Yves Klein from France. It's not every day that Westphal acquires 49 high-quality works at once. It's incredibly exciting for us to get a whole collection, or in this case, part of it, to be able to offer a complete collection. In previous years, few collectors were interested in zero art. As a result, many of those works were sold for bargain prices. That's changed, thanks to Sotheby's sensational auction. It went brilliantly. The auction just ended. We exceeded our highest estimate by 10 million pounds. It was unbelievable. Altogether, Westphal and her colleagues brought in more than 26 million euros for the Lenz collection nearly twice as much as expected. Gruyere cheese, named after the town of Gruyere in Switzerland, is a hard yellowish cow's milk cheese that's known as one of the finest for baking and melting. And while Gruyere facsimiles are now produced all over the globe, nothing tastes quite like the original made in its mountain homeland. The heavy wheels of Gruyere cheese spend five months aging. Their quality is guaranteed by a special seal, which ensures that the cheese has that unmistakable flavor. Gruyere cheese has a special flavor with a lot of character. The hazelnut flavor first unfolds in your mouth. Older Gruyere is especially spicy. It has many different aromas. The village of Gruyere gave the cheese and the surrounding region its name. Gruyere Castle dates from the 13th century. Today, just a hundred people live here. 
Yet this historic backdrop draws as many as a million tourists to the foothills of the Swiss Alps each year. The 2,000 meter high Molesson is a favorite destination for hikers and lovers of winter sports. The easiest way to reach the summit is with the cable railway. In the summer, cows graze on the mountain pastures on both sides of the track. Below the summit lies the restaurant Plan Francis, which is open year-round. In the kitchen, a piece of alpine gruyere from a mountain dairy awaits the approval of Haysandula, the head chef here. It's something very special. It's not so strong. You could say it tastes like it has wild herbs in it. Yet it's so creamy. It's not too salty. It's a fantastic cheese. Gruyère is the crowning glory in regional dishes like soup de chalet. It's made with ingredients typically found in mountain chalets or readily available outdoors. Leeks and celery are added to wild spinach and bear's garlic, also known as wild garlic. Noodles and potatoes are cooked in milk until they're soft. Then they're mixed with a generous shot of cream. Added at the very end, it's the gruyere which gives the soup its unique taste. I like the taste of milk, of cream, and the gruyere in it. This mixture produces a really unique aroma that I love. For me, that's the beauty of soup de chalet. Even if fewer of the alpine chalets are being operated by mountain farmers these days, there's still a great demand for their traditional dishes. Here you can enjoy a soup de chalet in the open air. Voilà la soupe. And after getting warmed up on the inside, visitors can then enjoy the nature and stunning views outside. Well, speaking of stunning, how do we define it in terms of a face? The quest for beauty is as old as the human race itself, and over time societies have come up with many of their own criteria for what makes a typically beautiful face. Well, now a new exhibition at the German Hygiene Museum in Dresden looks at our ideals of beauty through photography, video art and sculpture and finds there's much more to it than just a pretty face. It's always in the limelight desirable and promises coolness and success beauty but what's behind it we take a look through the german hygiene museum in dresden with aesthetics professor constanza perez for more than 30 years she's been researching the essence of beauty and why we find it so desirable Beautiful people are attractive sexually, so they're also sexually promising. We're here in the room devoted to beauty as a promise. It promises reproduction, quite simply, and conservation of the species. But I really think that's too narrow an interpretation. Other factors also play a role. But that's certainly one reason we're so thrilled by beauty. Hollywood stars such as Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie are considered beautiful. German photographer Martin Schoeller's pictures give us an unusual view of them from the front and flood lit. We see that a glamour girl suddenly has no effect on us because the atmosphere is missing. Next to her, we see Helen Mirren, a superb actress. She's unashamed of her wrinkles and has such an expressive face. That direct gaze she fixes us with, which is very disconcerting, contributes to her beauty. For centuries, people have been trying to give natural beauty a helping hand. Lipstick is an almost iconic beauty product of our times. By the 1920s at the latest, it was a must for every desirable woman. 
I think we need to be able to control the way we look and our own attractiveness. And I think this attractiveness is closely connected to eroticism or sexuality, an age-old connection, by the way, since Plato. Plato saw Eros as the force in people that leads them to pursue beauty. Since antiquity, scholars have been trying to measure beauty and agree on norms to define the homo bene figuratus, the well-formed human being. As a result, American researchers have developed a beauty mask based on the golden ratio. The ideal proportions are determined by symmetry. German artist Rosemarie Trockel has created strictly symmetrical faces in her beauty series. Her photographs combine one half of her subject's faces with digitally produced mirror images. When you look at them, you think, all these faces are beautiful, but something's wrong. It's alienating. The faces are perfectly symmetrical, but the strange thing is, they seem really boring. The people in the photographs have no charisma. Our brain reacts to faces and transmits specific signals when we perceive beauty in other people. Different parts of the brain are activated when we perceive beauty in landscapes or natural phenomena. People can also find objects or activities beautiful. The beauty of food, for example. In the last room in the Dresden exhibition, a film made by German video artist Gabriela Nagel shows 10 people talking about what they personally find beautiful. Not everyone can appreciate the other's tastes. A mathematician praises the number pi, for example, while a violin maker talks about the beauty of violins. Our hearing plays an essential role in our perception of beauty. If we perceive a flavor as pleasant or see oil glittering on our pasta, it influences us because it offers the promise of a delicious taste. I think we're very influenced by all of our senses and sensory associations. What is beauty? Despite many attempts to explain it, it seems our experience of it depends on feelings, differing perceptions and personality. But perhaps beauty's mysterious nature is its most alluring feature of all. Well, the beautiful Burgundy region in France is best known for its wines, but one little community there, about two hours south of Paris, has made itself a name as the city of books, La Charité sur Loire, and all thanks to one antiquarian book merchant there who felt a little bit lonely. La Charité sur Loire a small medieval town on the Loire River with a magnificent church, picturesque narrow streets and an astonishing number of bookshops. Many of them are on the town's main street. Christian Valerio was the town's first bookshop owner. He returned to his hometown in 1992 after spending 25 years in Paris. When we came here between 1992 and 1999, the town was a little worse for wear and nothing was happening. So we thought we could change that by making La Charité sur Loire into a town of books. We thought the town was well suited to the idea. The mayor asked Zenia Desfontaine to foster and market the project. Christian Valerio made use of his contacts to persuade people to open up secondhand bookshops in the town. Back then, 23 shops on this street were empty. Now, 12 bookshops have opened here, plus cafes, restaurants and souvenir shops. So this initiative has really revived the town. In the year 2000, La Charité sur Loire was officially named Town of Books. But along with bookshop owners, calligraphers and typographers were also attracted by the project. Sanchez Alamo is a bookbinder and his wife Els Baikenland is a calligrapher. Both of them came here from Paris in the summer of 2008. Our professions have something in common. We all work with books. That's why we liked the idea. And we're not too far away from Paris. 
La Charité sur Loire regularly stages events linked to books. The trade fairs and festivals and the monthly book markets draw exhibitors and both domestic and foreign tourists. More than half of the town's 50,000 annual visitors come especially for the books. But in a way, La Charité sur Loire is the victim of its own success. These days, there are no more shops to let, even for people who want them. And rents have risen drastically. Understandable, really. After all, which bookworm wouldn't want to live here? And for a warm finish, we're headed to a place that's blessed with mild weather all year round. The Portuguese island of Madeira is located in the Atlantic, about 700 kilometers west of Morocco. Now, Madeira has steered clear of mass tourism as it instead nurtures a culture of personalized service, which can be had at one of the many quintas that have been converted into high-class hotels. Madeira is often referred to as a floating garden or the island of perennial spring. For generations, its unique array of flora and fauna has enchanted visitors from all over the world. High above the capital Funchal, we find one of the island's most beautiful private gardens. Trees native to America, Africa, and Asia have stood for centuries in this subtropical plantation. There are 600 species of plant here, tended by a team of gardeners. At the center of the garden is an 18th century house. Today, it's a luxury hotel called the Quinta Jardinche du Lago. Jardinche means gardens, and the word lago refers to the pond that was set up especially for the swans. The word quinta is a historical concept, as the hotel director often explains to his guests. It is actually um, where the most wealthy Madeiran families and foreign families, they live uh, in Madeira. It's surrounded by gardens. You have a manor house and uh, you have a part of the, 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 the botanical area and a part of the agriculture area. Many of the quintas, they're still to be preserved. Like this one, we maintain the history and architecture to receive all guests. They're trying to find something special and calm in Madeira. The rooms have been furnished in traditional English style. The house was actually home to a British general 200 years ago. This kind of peaceful atmosphere can be found in many places, but Madeira's climate is more unusual. The weather in Madeira is absolutely fantastic all the year round. We have very mild temperatures on the winter. We do fantastic sun like we're having today. And in the summer, the temperatures, they don't go over 29. Curiosities at the Quinta include the residential giant tortoise named Colombo. Guests are asked not to feed him, but he's happy to pose for a snapshot. A number of celebrity guests have had their pictures taken with Colombo. The hotel director remembers one in particular. We have famous guests more, more or less all the year round, but one of the famous ones we, we had, it was uh, Chancellor Helmut Schmidt, who stayed with us in 2004 during the months of February, writing a book and enjoying Madeira's sun. We take a look now at another quinta that also offers sunshine, seaside and solitude. The Quinta da Rochinha is perched on a high cliff along Madeira's southern coast. Nestled between banana plants and the Atlantic, it overlooks the village of Ponto do Sol. Back in the 19th century, the Quinta belonged to the owner of a sugarcane plantation. Nine years ago, it was extended to include a modern section. The new building is on several levels, which can be reached via ramps, an elevator, or stairs. part that we built for the rooms and for the restaurant. Since it's almost impossible to imitate it to what is old, we decided for a contemporary architecture and very simple, very minimalist. Because the decoration is outside on the hills, on the blood of the ocean, so we don't need to put many things inside. You just let the nature come in. 
And with a bit of luck, you can get a room with a view of the sea. The Quinta is also known for its delicious cuisine. The restaurant serves a combination of traditional Portuguese and Mediterranean dishes, with the menu changing every day. In fact, with all that is available, once you've settled into this location, you may find you just don't want to leave. And that brings us to the end of this edition of our highlights. So until we meet again, auf Wiedersehen and bye-bye.